at this time, I would like to invite our host, Michael Cerciola, to lead us in our invocation. Michael? Thank you, Larry. Welcome to Calvary Christian Center. How are we doing tonight? How many, has anyone here driven more than 30 minutes to be here tonight? Just wave. Oh my goodness, so many of you. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. I know you're going to have a great time on this beautiful St. Patty's Day evening. Speaking of, an Irishman proposed to his girlfriend on St. Patty's Day, and he gave her a ring with a fake diamond in it. She didn't know that it was fake. She ran to her daddy, who happened to be a jeweler. He took one look at this ring and he knew that it wasn't real. And so, of course, this young lass returns back to her beloved, quite vehemently upset at the cheapness of this ring. He said, it was in honor of St. Patty's Day, I gave you a sham rock. <laughs> no, it didn't deserve that much applause. Speaking of shams, it's a short list when it comes to who can we trust these days, isn't it? Can we trust our Supreme Court? I was just talking with a gentleman on his way in here who said his wife had spent time in a Japanese internment camp. The Supreme Court upheld the internment of Japanese Americans as well as segregation laws. How about the presidency? Shall I go there? No. <laughs> can we trust our Congress? Can we trust the IRS? Oh, you all are passing this test with flying colors. Can we trust the NSA? Our society is adrift, isn't it? Every single agency, every position of power on every level seemingly has been corrupted and broken faith with us. And I'm reminded of the words of an old hymn. Many of you will probably recognize it. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ, the solid rock I stand, and all other ground is sinking sand. America's founders knew that the truth of Jesus Christ and the inspiration of the Holy Scriptures were the key to the formation of our unique government. And Ben Franklin at the Constitutional Convention said these words. He said, the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings, that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this. And I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. My friends, tonight I humbly submit to you that the answer to the questions that America faces will not come from a political party. The power to address the problems that plague our families and our cities will not come from a government agency. In the face of threats to liberty that rise against us from without and from within, our hope is not in technology nor the schemes of man. The warrior poet King David wrote, Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. He is the maker of heaven and earth. It has been said that America is great because America is good. And if America ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. America has fed and clothed the world. It has brought hope and liberty to the oppressed. It has been the beacon of freedom and hope unlike any other nation in history. But to the extent that we as a people abandon our loyalty to God, to the extent that we look to our own technology, to our own political power to take his place, well then we face his judgment and the diminishing of our greatness. In our humble gathering tonight. I imagine that some of you wonder, as I have, what can we possibly do? We live in a state that has been considered one of the least free in the entire union. What influence can we possibly have? 
against overwhelming problems? How can we stand? How can we stand up and make a difference? I'm reminded of Joshua. He was commissioned with leading God's people into the promised land after the death of Moses. And just like General George Washington took farmers and laborers and forged them into a continental army to confront the British Empire, Joshua took the sons of slaves who had been wandering the desert for 40 years and he hardened them into a fighting force to take on no less than 31 kings. The odds were overwhelming. And as George Washington was often seen wandering off alone to pray and to seek the face of God, Joshua did just that thing. It says, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with his sword drawn and in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the armies of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell face down on the ground in reverence, and he asked him, what message does the Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take your shoes off your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And Joshua experienced a vision of a warrior angel, and his first question was, are you on our side or on their side? How, how do you vote? <laughs> What's your political affiliation? Who are you registered with? And the angel replies, no one. My loyalty is not with the institutions of men, but to God alone. I report to him and I do his will. God does not owe us his favor just because we're Americans. It is we who owe our allegiance to God. God said, if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. We must be on the Lord's side, on the side of truth, on the side of good, on the side of righteousness. And once we've done that, then we have the same confidence that General George Washington had when he rode out against the armies of Britain. The same confidence that Joshua had as he rode out against the 31 kings of Canaan. We can overcome any problem. We can defeat any foe. If God is for us, who can be against us? I encourage you tonight to take a stand, to be passionate about what it is that you believe and what you know to be true. Be strong, be courageous, do not be afraid, and do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I have no doubt tonight that I am surrounded by passionate, freedom-loving Americans. Do not be discouraged. With God's help, we can accomplish anything. And with that in mind, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight with gratitude that we are Americans. More than any other people in this world or in history, we have experienced liberty and wealth and abundance, and we know why. It's because of your favor. It's because of your blessing. Our founders made covenants with you, and to our shame, we have broken them. We and our fathers, we've turned from you and from your righteous ways. Forgive our sins. Heal our land. We humbly ask you to restore our relationship with you. Lord, make us men and women of purity and integrity and courage. Without you, Lord, we are lost and beyond all hope. But with you, we know that all things are possible. Be with us. Have mercy on us. Let us see miracles take place in our community and our nation. Lead us in the way that you would have us to go. In Jesus' name, and everyone said. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Pastor Michael. This is just awesome to see this crowd here this evening. How did you guys hear about us? I mean, where did you hear about the meeting? Uh, Flyers, the newspapers. Oh, email. Yeah, we sent a lot of emails out. Where was the territorial dispatch? 
Agenda 21 Radio. Great. How many veterans do we have here this evening? Would you please stand? Let's give thanks to our veterans. Thank you for your service. If you'll remain standing, and uh, I would like to ask Larry Mertz from our group if he will lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance this evening. Larry? There he is, right there. Thank you. We have a special treat for you this evening. The National Anthem by Jill Leal. Jill? Many would like to hear her at one of our tea party meetings. Huh? Maybe the 4th of July, huh? <laughs> at this time, I would like to recognize some of our distinguished public servants. I believe we have uh, 
Supervisor John Nicoletti from Yuba County here. John? <laughs> Supervisor Roger Abe from Yuba County. Supervisor. Hi, Roger. Supervisor Andy Vasquez from Yuba County. Way back there. Hey. Welcome, Andy. We have Supervisor Stan Cleveland from Sutter County. Stan? We have our Auditor Controller from Sutter County, Robert Stark. Robert? Oh, way back there. Are there any other elected officials, public servants that I've missed? Those are the ones walking around. The school board. Rob? Oh, yeah, way in the back seat. Hi, Rob. We also have, to my knowledge, a couple candidates that are running for office in the June primaries. We have our own uh, Michael Giraldo, who is a candidate for second district supervisor, Sutter County. Michael? Way in the back, Mike. It's the one with the I like Mike button on him. <laughs> and we also have a Sutter County Auditor Controller candidate, uh, Nathan Black. Nathan, right here. Do we have any other candidates that I didn't see when I came in? Oh, Ryan Shore, running for 3rd Assembly District. Sorry I missed you coming in, Ryan. Any other candidates? Great, and thank you. We like our public servants. We also have a couple other distinguished guests. We have Patricia Miller, who's president of the Sutter County Taxpayers Association. <laughs> Pat. And as a reminder, we're co-hosting some candidate forums for the month of uh, April and May. We're hosting with the Sutter County Taxpayers Association. So that'll be the first and third Monday for April and May. We also have a very distinguished, nationally known, American hero, <laughs> Paul Preston with Agenda 21 Radio. Paul? At this time, if you can bear with us, we would like to take up a donation to pay our rent, to pay for our facilities, our insurance, and for the events such as this that we put on. So if you can bear with us. What, are we missing somebody like Mike? They'll be passing the plate while I make a couple announcements. Just kind of a brush up on March 3rd, which was our last meeting, we canceled it to go to Nevada City. The Nevada County Tea Party was hosting Rafael Cruz, the, the father of Ted Cruz. And we had from our Sutter Buttes Tea Party 50 people there. And I want to thank you for that. And they were honored by our presence, so thank you. Coming up, we have uh, next Saturday, the Blue Spar Star Moms Care Package Party, uh, September, or March 22nd, Saturday, 4 p.m. to pack the packages, and then at 6, uh, spaghetti dinner. And the uh, Sutter Buttes Tea Party is getting two tables. So see Carla or I if you want to go, and we have... Liz, did you want to say a word? <laughs> she's, she's our Blue Star Mom hero. She has three kids in the service today, and I believe one's in Afghanistan today. And Carl and Liz, thank you for your service. Our next meeting is going to be March 31st. We usually do the first and third Monday. Well, we're going to do the fifth Monday this month. 
and the reason being we're going to have a candidate forum and it will be with the Sutter County District Attorney candidates. They all have confirmed except the Assistant District Attorney Sutter County who declined to talk to us. But the other three will definitely be there. So that's going to be March 31st. It'll be over at the Realtor's Office, 1558 Star Drive, and our regular time, uh, 630. One, actually two more announcements. Remember tax day, April 15th, we're all going to the Capitol and protest our taxes. It'll be the annual tax day rally for the Tea Parties, and they're going to be doing it all over the nation. Let's have one of the bigger turnouts here in Sacramento. And then uh, notice that I just got, uh, actually a, about a week or so ago, is that our Congressman John Garamendi is having a town hall meeting tomorrow at, from 5 to 7 p.m., and it'll be in the Lee Burrow Center at 630 East, East Street. And they encourage all third assembly or third congressional district uh, residents to come and ask questions. It's going to be open question period, so please come. That's tomorrow. Now the reason you're here, and getting back to Mr. Uh, Paul Preston, he introduced us to our guest. It was one of his guests on his show that really intrigued us and, and got us together. So I thank Paul for that. General Vallely graduated from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and was commissioned in the Army in 1961, serving as a distinguished career 31 years in the Army. He retired in 1991 from the U.S. Army as Deputy Commanding General, U.S. Army Pacific in Honolulu, Oh boy, that's a rough place to retire. <laughs> uh, General Valley's a graduate of infantry school, ranger and airborne school, jump master school, command and general staff school, the industrial college of the arm. You didn't do anything but go to school, I guess. <laughs> His combat service was in Vietnam, included positions as infantry company commander, intelligence officer, operations officer, military advisor, and aide de camp. He has over 15 years experience in special operations and psychological and civil military operations. He served in many overseas theaters, including Europe and the Pacific Rim countries, as well as two combat tours in Vietnam. I can go through on and on and on with his distinguished career, but I'd like to introduce Major General Paul Vallely. Let's let him tell us about it, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Larry. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, great. Wow, thank you. I'm all mic'd up so I can... Can you hear me in the back all right? Good, okay, wow. You know, I am so happy I got up in Montana at 4 o'clock this morning <laughs> to catch a flight here at 6 to Salt Lake City and get here at 9.30. And uh, I'm staying with my sister uh, and... Uh, she lives down in Lake Wildwood, and they're here tonight, friend Gary, uh, my nephew Matt, and uh, we have some other uh, guests from, uh, who've come up from uh, Lake Wildwood. But uh, what a pleasure. Paul, thank you for putting this all together. My pleasure. Yeah. Uh, as far as the... Uh, that star-spangled banner tonight... Can I get a copy? I want to play you all over the United States. Huh? Do you have a CD? Boy, I'll tell you what, that would be my opening uh, at, at every opportunity that I get to speak across the country. That, that is uh, just tremendous. Thank you very much. And Michael, thank you uh, for your kind words and uh, opening remarks. Uh, I was reflecting. Uh, back two things while you were talking, Michael. Uh, in uh, 2006, I was 99% dead. I'd had an aortic aneurysm. And uh, I'd just come back from Paris, France. And so timing and everything is very important. 
And so uh, ambulance and two helicopter rides, by the time I got to the hospital and uh, open chest, I had uh, 10 minutes to live. I would bled out completely. And as a result of that, my wife ended up writing, Michael, an article of the 12 miracles that happened that day to save my life. And uh, uh, I felt a reincarnation at that time. And right after that, I, my sister knows, I started writing again. I wrote with more clarity than I ever have in my life. And that was after almost, uh, well, six months. If you have open chest, any of you have had that, you know, it's four to six months minimum. But it was a reflection of why I am here, why we're here to serve, why God guides us. And I'll tell you the story when I was inside Syria last year, uh, in the belly of the beast in Aleppo, Syria. And uh, in the convoy, I'm thinking, I am in God's hands. I'm in the most dangerous place in the world. And I'm 74 years old, and why am I here? I'll tell you a little more about Syria as we go along. But uh, that was the reflection, Michael, that I had as to why we're here and what all of us have to do each day uh, to make this a better world and to commit ourselves in any, any way that we can. I thought this evening uh, about a number of things. I don't know how much time we have, but uh, I'm prepared to stay all night if you want to do an all-nighter. <laughs> All the time I need. Thank you very much. But Larry, thank you for putting this all together. Uh, and Paul, you know, taking the lead, and uh, it's just been great. And Elaine, you're here, and we've traded emails, and uh, so all of a sudden I feel part of the family. My wife actually is a fourth generation California. Her, uh, her grandmother uh, lived in Sierra City uh, as well as Nevada City. And so when we lived in the Bay Area, we'd take the time, uh, my sister and Gary, we'd go up to Sierra City, do a little fishing. And uh, when I first met uh, my wife's grandmother at her home in Nevada City now, she says, don't you drink in front of her. <laughs> and so uh, about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, here's this 80-year-old uh, grandmother. She says, Paul, how'd you like a martini? <laughs> she and I became instant friends uh, at, at that time. But uh, anyhow, my, my wife, uh, uh, her father, uh, her grandfather actually, uh, no, her great-grandfather, got to get it right, was the first ferry boat captain in San Francisco Bay before they had the bridges. And his name was Zephaniah Hatch. How's that for a biblical name? So uh, my, both my children were born here uh, in California when I got back from Vietnam. And uh, after my first, no, after my second tour in 1968, I was stationed at the Presidio of San Francisco. So uh, we have uh, a lot of friends a lot of connections and relations uh, with people and organizations still in California. Uh, but we hide out in Montana, the best, safest place to live in America. <laughs> the, uh, there's so much to talk about, but again, I, I want to reflect just maybe a couple weeks ago. I was flying across the country, and I was looking down and over middle America. And I was thinking back to when I was a boy in Pennsylvania before I went to West Point. What a marvelous time the 40s were after World War II and the 50s. How many were there? How many of you were there experiencing that? America was at its best. People were working, the attitude, the culture. It was absolutely wonderful. And then as I flew further west, I'm saying, what the hell has happened to this country? Where have we gone in so fast? It's just incredible. Um, you still like <laughs> There you go, back in the 50s. Another great West Point graduate. Uh, the, uh, the historical part of, uh, as, as I look back, America really changed in the 60s dramatically. And we've been progressing down a road uh, that's taking us to places that are unknown and very dangerous. And that's why the, my theme uh, tonight is America at a crossroads. And at a crossroads, when you hit that, you take a right or a left, or you go straight. So the question is, where is America going to go from this day forward? Which road are we going to take? Are we going to go on the progressive route? Or are we going to go back to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the values America was built on? Which road are we going to take?
And that's the question we have to answer because we can all be a part of that, as Michael said, with hope. But hope is not a strategy. So we have to have a way to carry that hope out and hopefully really look at the future generations. When I kicked off the Tea Party event in South Carolina in January, uh, we had about 600 people there in Myrtle Beach. It was absolutely outstanding. We had a wonderful group. And as a result of that, I've, I'm talking to another six tea parties around the country in the next few months. But we determined uh, that we had to have a cause, we had to create our own media, that we have to tell the story, we have to get involved, we got to stand up. And uh, what I pointed out to uh, the tea party there was, we really have to focus on what I call the 30-year-olds. 25 to 40-year-olds, we got to get them involved, and for those of you in that age group that are here tonight, thank you for being here. But we have to reach out to them because they have more impact on the teenagers, say, that I, than I do or some of the older people have. So the link to America, because they're the ones educated now, they're in their business, uh, they're in their very formative years of raising families. This whole thing's going to fall back on them, but we need them to get involved to help us solve the problems of America today. So as we reach out, reach out to the youth and bring them in and tell them we want to be a part of their future and to work with them. As we get older, we uh, should be people of wisdom. I was at a dinner with Dr. Ben Carson Thursday night. We had 1,300 in Montana for Dr. Ben Carson's dinner. <clears throat> And, uh, and I had been with him in uh, November back in Florida, but uh, Dr. Dr. Carson is a, a, a man of common sense. He, he really uh, is artic very soft-spoken. But he said one important thing. He said, what happened genetically to the American people? That gene of common sense somehow has gone by the wayside. And when you look at Washington, D.C., and you look at a lot of people today, what the hell are you talking about? Where's your common sense? It's not there. I'm sure you see that all the time. But I thought that was rather interesting that he would point that out. Um, but it was a marvelous evening with him. He gave a great talk. But if we are at a crossroads, then what, what must we do? Let me talk a little bit about uh, the threats to America. And uh, one of the things that we established at the uh, South Carolina meeting is the Tea Party now has to go to a, a new level. You must consider national security. Besides the domestic, the constitution, all the things that the Tea Party build on now, we must bring it up to a level now because without securing our country, none of this makes a difference. All these issues make no difference unless we can secure America, secure our towns, secure our, our families. And the threats that are going on out there against us are more horrendous than you think they may be of our enemies out there. Uh, within the last 18 months, I've been into the Middle East four times. I've been inside Syria. I'm the only senior American that's been inside to meet with the rebels and the opposition forces. I had 400 men with me when I went in. I was in their hands that day. Uh, I'm the only senior American that's met with General al-Sisi in Egypt. I met with him in November. And uh, I'll be going back to Egypt probably in about another month. But when I look ahead at the threats out there and the fact that when I go around, we don't have any friends anymore. We have no allies. People do not trust our government. Neither do we. Neither do we. I knew someone was going to say that. So, uh, you know, when you look at the state of affairs and uh, you look at Lurch, excuse me, Senator Kerry. Uh, <laughs> You know, as he travels around the world and absolutely accomplishes nothing, we look at uh, Hillary Clinton burning up all that jet fuel, accomplishing zero. You know, when you think about it, we have not had a diplomatic victory since the early 90s when the wall went down. Think about it. And look at all the money out there. Everything we do or don't do reflects back on America. I can tell you everybody loves the American people. When you travel around, uh, they love the American people, but they do not trust our government anymore. And so when you have a lack of leadership uh, and you la have a lack of, of what we call forward strategy, 
You know, I look back when uh, I, I've done probably over 50 O'Reilly shows uh, on Fox News, and uh, as we debated uh, what was going on in the early 2000s, we did something right. In 2001, after 9-11, you may recall uh, the fall of 2001, 100 men, paramilitary and CIA, with air power, kicked the hell out of the Taliban and al-Qaeda in 31 days. Unconventional. And what do we start doing? Building bases, conducting conventional warfare. The generals are way off on their strategy, way off on what we should be doing. And we look at the internal affairs over there now in Iraq, all that human resource, all the money, zero return for America. Same thing's going to be for Afghanistan. With all the troops and the forces we put, nothing. Because of a bad strategy, because of incompetent leaders in Washington, D.C., people that aren't trained to fight our wars anymore, generals and admirals that won't stand up as our military is being purged. So when I look at what the Iranians are doing today, uh, their main goal for their nuclear development program is to conduct an electromagnetic pulse attack on America. That's a low-yield nuclear weapon. They're planning on shooting it probably from a container ship off of New York, off of Washington, Miami, Los Angeles, and Seattle. Look up, and you can Google this. It's called the Club K system, C-L-U-B-K system. It's a container system where they can put a Shahab 3 in with a nuclear warhead. It's all been tested, by the way, with North Korea. It does all the testing, by the way, for Iran. That's why Iran doesn't have to do anything. They test it all with North Korea. So when you look at that entire chessboard of the Middle East, and you look at the threats, and you look at the center of terror, which is Tehran, if they can pop one nuclear weapon, low yield, EMP, electromagnetic pulse, guess what our target is? Our grid system. They're already testing out how to bring America down in 72 hours by taking down our grid system. You heard of the attack in California last year, the snipers that took out a station? They're testing all around, but they know our greatest vulnerability because if they can do the MP, EMP attack on us, everything that's run by computer shuts down. All the cars, airplanes fall out of the sky. Everything falls. So when you look at that threat that's going on out there, and to think we can just uh, sanctions against Iran, how well have they worked? <laughs> now we want to do sanctions against Russia. Good luck on that. Yeah, we got Putin playing hardball, playing master chess, and we got a leader that's playing marbles. Uh, we got professionals in the world against amateurs. And so when I look at the threats out there from radical Islam, and uh, some of you people know I had a hit put out on me a month ago. Uh, by a Chesnian uh, in, uh, in Syria. I'm the only American that's uh, been, had a hit put out on him in the, in, in the last uh, few years. And I put a hit out on him the next day. So, <laughs> anyway, it's on YouTube. You can watch it unless they pulled it off. It says Valilee in Syria, and you'll see the convoy going through Aleppo. Uh, rather interesting. Uh, but I know what real threats are, and when you get over there on the ground, how many listen to television every day? Watch it. Huh? Fox News? Anybody watch Fox News? Uh, and you see what's going on. You see all of these uh, people on the talk shows and all these uh, people are expounding on their knowledge of what's going on and telling you just like the Malaysian airliner. We'll talk a little bit about that. And I get a kick out of it because nobody ever gets out of Washington. <coughs> McCain goes over to Syria and he meets with the wrong people. I came back and I told that to somebody. McCain says, you tell Valley I met with the right people. No, he met with the wrong people that were being supported by al-Qaeda. I met with the freedom lovers, the free Syrian army people, who are the ones that started the opposition against Assad. I go into Egypt and I meet with al-Sisi. We haven't had a delegation go over yet. One month after I left Egypt, 
After we declared we're not going to support them because they needed new helicopters for the Sinai against Al-Qaeda, they needed to protect the Suez Canal, what do we do? Pulled the plug on them. Been allies of us, uh, of the United States, for over 40 years, and good allies. And the Egyptians are good people. But they saw what they had to do. They would not allow the Muslim Brotherhood to control Egypt. And the military was brought in to prevent civil, civil, civil unrest over there. They had burned over 80 churches. 80 churches. I met with Pope Tadras over there. And uh, what they were doing to Christianity over there. Now guess who comes out against the Muslim Brotherhood? Egypt now declares it illegal. And guess who else? Saudi Arabia last week. But yet we have Muslim Brotherhood coming into the White House. We're putting them homeland security. We got them in the Pentagon. What is wrong with us? I mean, is that crazy? The Muslim Brotherhood wants a global caliphate. They want to kill every Christian they can find. Sharia law. And we have mosques being built all over this country. I got a call from Nashville, Tennessee. They're building a big one back, back there. The mosques are nothing but Trojan horses in this country. That's what the radical Islamists do. They recruit, the cells are developed. Look what's happened in England and Holland. It's all out there. I'm not making any of this up. You all know it. You see it. But we all have to do our homework. We have to understand it. Now, Ukraine, you have to, as General al I was telling my sister this, when I sat with General al he says, why, America, can't you look through our eyes and see what's happening? Do you know we supported the Muslim Brotherhood, the State Department, Al Morse, we supported the government, our government, supported the Muslim Brotherhood. Rather than freedom-loving democracy people like General al-Sisi and the rest of the youth that were trying to, in their second revolution, 33 million people stood up in Egypt and said, we're not going to tolerate it. 33 million people. We're lucky to get a million people out. We're lucky to get 10,000 out. But their pain got so great that they weren't going to tolerate it anymore. So you look at that threat, you look at our borders, uh, you look at our inability at the federal level now, uh, we're completely broken at the federal level. We can't seem to get anything done. Republican, Democrat, nothing gets done in Congress. Look at all these hearings. I'm part of the Benghazi Commission. We're trying to get a select committee. We got a Republican named John Boehner who will not get a select committee going so we can subpoena everybody. Okay, Boehner's got to go. Mitch McConnell's got to go. Uh, we have got to put enough force on Washington that these people resign. Resign before the elections. So, I don't know whether we'll get enough people in America to stand up to do that. It can be done. You know, our Constitution allows impeachment. That's not going to happen because of partisan politics. But certainly we can force resignation. Obama's not going to step down on his own, but I'll tell you what, if we do a no-confidence vote uh, resolution in Congress, that would surely help. That's another issue that we're working on. We've got to put maximum pressure back there. And we've got to ask these people to step down if they can't do the job. And that's re established Republicans as well as Democrats and the, and the rest of them. The establishment in the Republic Party is no better than the Democrats. They're all in for money, get elected, and they can't move ahead. The Tea Party people are the salvation of this country. And I say that sincerely. This is what I said, this is what I said in uh, South Carolina. It's the grassroots. We have to do it because we can't depend on these career politicians to do it. We've got to get term limits, term these people out, put them back there for two terms, and they're gone. I was telling uh, Gary and Jewel earlier today, 47%, based on our studies that we've done, of the federal government can be eliminated, and we wouldn't miss it tomorrow. 47%. With much of those responsibilities going back to the states, 
We don't need the IRS anymore. Let's get a fair tax in there. Everybody's got some skin in the game. All the poor people are paying taxes anyhow when they have to buy food. So everybody's in the game on a fair tax. Get rid of the IRS. The Treasury can handle all that money coming in. It's all digital electronic today. Every member of Congress should not be in Washington more than one month every quarter. They should be back in their states. They don't need to be back in Washington trying to legislate. We've come up with programs to delegislate and deregulate. How about that? Everybody that's running for office say, what do you think about the delegislation and deregulation program? They're going to go, what? <laughs> There's Nancy Pelosi. No, it wasn't Nancy Pelosi. I think it was uh, uh, Senator Feinstein uh, yesterday wanted more regulation. What was she on television for? I can't remember. I just saw a little bit of it. What was it? Oh, see, yes, yeah, she wanted more regulation. Oh, I can't remember exactly what it was. But that's what they want to do. More regulations telling us what to do. Control our lives. My God, we don't need you. Don't let us alone. We're educated. We're smart. We know how to work. But they can't do it. And so unless we can bust that up, I don't see a lot of hope that, that we can change our government just with normal politics. I just don't see it happening. Uh, again, we're trying to get this select committee, uh, Admiral Lyons, myself, and General McInerney, riding hard on John Boehner. Now, if John Boehner doesn't want to do it, we found out he then may be complicit with the administration on the cover-up. I did a Rollo Rivera show uh, right after uh, Panetta testified and uh, Clinton and General Dempsey. Do you remember that hearing? And so, uh, what difference does it make? Uh, and uh, Panetta got up, and General Dempsey, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and he said, we didn't have any assets in the area to attempt to rescue. Complete falsehood lie. We had assets in Italy, we had ship assets, we had Special Forces assets. And for eight hours, Ty Woods, we may not have been able to say him, but if I was Ty Woods, come get me, come help me, I need your help. We didn't even try to rescue those four. Is that criminal? Yes. That is criminal, they should be put in jail. Yes. And they lied in front of the American people. Anyhow, I was on Araldo, and Araldo says, uh, he says, well, General Valley, you said the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs lied. I said, Araldo, look at it this way. Now, if I'm the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and I don't know where my assets are, Navy, Air Force, Marines, I'm pretty damn dumb. Because all I gotta do is make a few phone calls. How many ships do we have there? Where are the airplanes at, right? And then Panetta, who's Secretary of Defense, should know that as the Secretary of Defense. So if they're not lying, they don't know what the hell they're doing. I mean, it's, 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 there's no gray area there. And, of course, Geraldo being sort of a left-wing type of guy, uh, trying to support him, he still does today. I offered to take Geraldo into Syria with me. He wouldn't go. <laughs> but uh, uh, who I do communicate with regularly, though, is Laura Logan. Uh, she's a wonderful guy on 60 Minutes. And uh, I invited her to go, too. And she's, remember, she got in trouble on the Benghazi. They had... Uh, one of the interviewees come on and he wrote a book and there were a lot of falsehoods. But um, uh, I communicate with a lot of these people in the media and try to get them involved and give them as much information as we can. Um, so you got all those threats internationally and then the threats, uh, again, like I just mentioned, within our own government. I gave a talk in Florida three years ago and they said, General Valley, what are the major threats to America? I said, well, for my talk today, I prepared, I've got five of them. And I said, you're going to be surprised when I tell you the greatest threat to America. And they looked at me and I said, the federal government. Yes. The federal government, our own government is the biggest threat to the future of America. <laughs> and then I went on down, Russia and Iran and radical Islam and so on. 
But uh, again, I'm, I'm just absolutely f flabbergasted every morning when I turn television on and see what's going on. And I see uh, the inability to get anything done. Now, if we're at that state of affairs, at that crossroads in America now, what do we have to do? We've got to throw them out, absolutely. But we need new leadership. We've got to get them to resign. We've got to put some qualified people in. I'd love to get Trey Gowdy in there to replace John Boehner. Larry Jordan from Ohio. Mike Lee from Utah. We've got some good people, and they need help. You've got Ted Cruz. I like Ted. We're trying to get him a little educated on national security. Uh, I was on a phone call with Steve, uh, oh goodness, what's his name, from Iowa, Steve, uh, Steve help me, he's a congressman from Iowa, real, uh, who? Yeah, Stephen King, yeah, Steve King. So he was telling me, he said, Paul, he said, you know, we have almost nobody in Congress today that can articulate anything on national security. They don't understand the military, they don't understand the Russians, they don't understand what's going on in Syria. He said they're so involved in trying to get reelected and all these issues, they can't drill down below one level on national security. He says we only have a few in the Senate. I said, Steve, that is, that is really disheartening. So here we are in the state of affairs, 2014, with so many threats going on around the world, and we don't have people who can articulate it. And then you look at the CIA. Our intelligence is on their derriere. The CIA station chief in Istanbul called me and wanted to know why I didn't check in with him before going into Syria. I said, well, you knew where I was. You could have come down and talked to me. He's in his office in Istanbul. He couldn't get in there. I'm the only guy who could get him inside Syria and that he wouldn't be killed. They won't get off their derrieres off, out of their offices. And uh, I mean, the tragedy, I mean, that what was shared with me in Egypt, and the, the horror story of our ambassador there supporting the Muslim Brotherhood, they, they just couldn't believe it. Uh, what I'd like to do now, do you want to talk about the Malaysian airliner? Yeah. Uh, I've got Matt, my nephew, wants to come up and talk about that. <laughs> he, he believes it was a mothership. <laughs> They came down and just sucked that 777 up, and they're out there somewhere, right, Matt? Huh? I mean, that's as good a scenario as any. But I did get a call from an Air Force general uh, in Las Vegas, and he's, 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 he says, this is a pretty good information. I says, well, tell me what it is. Uh, he said, well, the Politburo is in a big Ponzi financial scheme with Japan and America, and the uh, Chinese military found out about it, and there were three Chinese generals on board. This is a true story now. I'm, not, I'm joking on this one. And uh, they ordered a shoot-down of the airplane. The pilots were then told to uh, turn off all their transponders and everything, go to a lower altitude, and uh, from what he told me today, they think it landed in India, a clandestine airfield in India. So I don't know. That's the latest, other than the mothership from my nephew. <laughs> it sounds to have the most credence. Isn't that interesting, though, where that airplane is? Huh? And no tracking. So uh, we'll see if that Indian story uh, develops. But evidently, yes? Which one, the mothership or the other one? <laughs> the real story. Well, the Chinese Politburo, you know, uh, two years ago they took the senior guy and they put him in prison. I mean, they're very crooked. And they're very coarse into making billions of dollars. Well, evidently they were in this big money scheme with members uh, of the Japanese government and certain members of the uh, U.S. government. And there's a fourth country involved. And evidently the uh, Chinese military found out about it. Three of the generals who knew about it were supposedly on the airplane going from Kuala Lumpur back to Beijing. Uh, and uh, they had received uh, uh, an order or some kind of communication that uh, the plane was going to be shot out of the air once it crossed into Chinese airspace. 
And so that's why they dove, took off to an undisclosed airport in India. This is good as a mothership, Matt. <laughs> so anyhow, that's a lady. General, uh, the, the general from Las Vegas who's getting this information calls me about every six hours and sort of upstate me. So we'll see what happens in the future. Well, why don't we do this? I mean, I could talk on and on about a lot of different things. Uh, why don't we uh, open it up some questions and answers and do it that way. Is that all right, Paul? Yeah. Larry? Yeah. Can you tell us about extortion 17, please? Extortion 117? Yeah. 17. Extortion, extortion 17. 17. Are you familiar with extortion 17? <clears throat> extortion 17 was a call sign helicopter of the Chinook helicopter that went down three months after bin Laden was taken out in Pakistan. On board were 32 of our greatest warriors, a lot of 17 members of SEAL Team 6 who took out bin Laden, August 2011. They sent him out on an ambush in the wrong helicopter. It was not an MH-47 that was especially tailored for special operations. They sent him out to get a high-value target, at the same time tried to rescue some rangers who were out on a mission uh, in a valley out there. Uh, they got overhead. They didn't get permission to take out ground fire that was coming up. They had birds around. Rules of engagement prevented them from taking out the enemy that was in the area because of casualties that would have been taken by civilians. They fired RPGs from a roof, shot the Chinook out of the air, all perished, burned to death. The book is out now, it's called Betrayed. You can get it. And so uh, the parents showed up two weeks ago and again to get a hearing. The Pentagon sent two low-level people over at the hearing. The government covered that up just like they did with Tillman. The cover-ups are incredible within the military right now that are going on. But our troops know about it. That helicopter was sent on a bogus mission with the SEAL team guys that took out Bin Laden, all were killed on board. Unbelievable. Have you heard about it? Investigation again? Nowhere. Who was the colonel that ordered that? Who was the colonel that ordered that they couldn't use supporting fires out there to put our men in jeopardy? And there were seven Afghans on board that were switched out one half hour before that helicopter took out on the manifest. That's the stuff. So that's Extortion 17. You can read about it in the book Betrayed. I funded that book, by the way. So, yes, sir. Yeah, can you tell us a little more about what's going on at the top ranks of the military? Okay. Two more were purged yesterday, two more in Navy. Probably saw it. Uh, the purging that you've been reading about or hearing about, um, over 140 officers now have been purged uh, out of the military. Now, some of them for indiscretions and uh, misconduct, but the vast majority have been removed because they haven't fallen in line with the Obama ideology. And they're standing up because of the cuts that are going on within the military. They've also purged the training manuals. They've taken out everything in the training manuals that ever even refers to radical Islam or Sharia or the, or the caliphate. Anything where you say victory, you can't even talk about victory anymore. The generals don't know how to say victory. What did MacArthur say? There is no substitute for victory. When we go to war, we better go for a good reason, but we better go to win. Sun Tzu said, the great Chinese strategist, extended wars benefit nobody. Three years, nine months, we took out the Nazis and the Japanese, two of the major powers of the world. Three years and nine months. Look how many years in Iraq. Look how long we've been in Afghanistan now. 
Went in there in 2001, 2014. We're going to come out. No victory, because they you can't say victory. They're purging Christianity within the military. The chaplain's corps. The flags that can't be flown. The Air Force Academy. General Boykin and I have just sent a letter, I hope it will be published next week, that they've taken God out of a lot of their material, of their oaths and everything else, because they don't want to impact on other pe people of different faiths and beliefs. Air Force Academy. It's permeated all throughout our system, ladies and gentlemen. So you have a purge of the military. Now, here's an interesting thing. They're purging the First Amendment rights of our military. I had breakfast three months ago with a young lieutenant who was going to join the fleet in Seattle. And he says, General, I, I hate to go back because he said, it's unbelievable. We spend more training time on sexual harassment than we do on training on our guns and what we're, what we're supposed to be on the ship for. The social engineering within the military. Unbelievable what's going on. But the purge of the First Amendment rights, he said, when we go in the galley to have breakfast, the senior officers sort of look over our shoulders to see what we're talking about, like political commissars. He said, it's unbelievable. We're afraid to talk about anything because we're going to get purged. We're not going to get promotions. The CIA guys who were in Benghazi were purged. I just had to sign an undisclosure agreement that they wouldn't talk about what happened in Benghazi or their careers would be over. That's this tyrannical government from the White House. And we've placed a lot of it back on Valerie Jarrett. Obama can't go to the bathroom without asking Valerie, okay? <laughs> That's how serious it is. Incompetence to the nth degree. By design, by the way. They have their agenda. We all know that. And they're executing that agenda. So, there again, you got a multiple dimensional purge going on with our armed force. And the morale, I can tell you, is about as low as it's ever been. And they're taking away benefits. The Veterans Administration is so screwed up. It's, it's absolutely unbelievable. And you've seen the stories on that. Claims in there by veterans over two years. And then they wiped out the database last year. And so those claims were never acted upon. So, uh, but let me, let me turn a little bit to the positive side. And Michael, you alluded to that. We can do something about it. We're not going to go down without a fight, are we? We're not going to go down without a fight. All of us are going to fight. You see, I, if you know what a warrior is, the greatest characteristic and quality of a warrior is courage. None of the people in Washington that I see have any cojones. <laughs> is that all right, Michael, if I say that? Huh? <laughs> the wussification of America. I mean, they have no courage. They're afraid. Man, I'd be Jack and Harry Reed up against the wall every morning if I could, you know? Uh, I was even thinking about writing an article to bring dueling back. I mean, jeez. I mean, let's show some manhood. I mean, we've got women who have got more cojones. I don't know what you say about women, but we have women who have more cojones than the, the guys. And there must be a word out there. I, I keep asking my wife if she could research that for me. But um, that's it's a sad state of affairs. I look at my young grandson. I just wonder what's going to happen, you know, as he grows up. But we've got to do something. That's the positive side. God has given us the ability to take faith and hope and move it into action. Okay? I go to a Bible study group in Big Fork, Montana, where I live, and I'm talking, they read the Bible and doing everything, and uh, they're praying. I said, well, okay, and then what are you going to do? I said, I pray too, but I've got to go out and do something about it. Okay? And that's what God wants you to do. Pray, hope, but then take action. Be responsible. And that's what we all have to do. Anyhow, next question.
Am I taking too yes. much time? No, no, that's fine. They say in Yuba City you got to be in bed by at least nine o'clock. So <laughs> I don't know whether that's okay. true or not. Hey, huh? I got a question on. Uh, can you comment on your time w that you spent in mind control programs and the affiliation with Colonel Aquino? Oh boy, that's a great one. Yeah. I've been called a Satanist, by the way. Good Catholic boy, older boy. And, uh, let me tell you the story about Major Aquino. It's quite a story, because it was all over the internet and Facebook and that, that I was a Satanist. Uh, you could probably find it there in some radio station in Texas. Uh, anyhow, back in the uh, 1980s, I commanded the Seven Psychological Operations Group. And the Army asked me to conduct a study on the Russian telepathic and what the, the Russians were doing, mind warfare. Because the Russians have always been very good at that. Deception and uh, what we call strategic psychological operations, which they're using now, by the way. So uh, I got this young major, a brilliant guy, PhD, graduate of the University of Santa Barbara. Uh, and uh, I noticed at a banquet one night that he came in and he had, his hair was coming down to a point real black, and then his wife came in, she was all in black, and I said, God, a couple of sort of reminds me of the Munsters. <laughs> I didn't think that much about it. Well, about a month later, we were on a maneuver down at Camp San Luis Obispo. So I go into a restaurant one night, we were Friday night off, and there were four guys in there, and they got these medallions on their chest, the uh, satanic uh, medallion. So I'm looking at them, and I'm trying to figure out what the heck's going on? So I come back and talk to my chief of staff the next day. I said, we got some guys that are wearing medallions. I, I don't know what the heck they are. They look a little fishy to me. Uh, I said, uh, we better check on it. And he said, yeah, they're, uh, they're Satanists. And they've been recruiting within the Army. And about that same time down in Fort Hood, Texas, they had the Wiccans. I don't know whether you remember that. They were recruiting a lot of the women into the witches, the Wiccans. Well, anyhow, my, the three-star general I was working for uh, told him about it. He says, I want you to conduct an investigation of what's going on because the rumors are getting out that they're recruiting uh, for the satanic church. So we did, an, I signed a colonel in charge of it. He did the investigation. What was happening, remember Gordon, what was it, uh, LeVay, Anton LeVay, he did Rosemary's Baby, right? Major Aquino was his deputy in the Church of Saint of California. 501C approved church. And he was the Prince of uh, Set. That was, you can Google this, Prince of Set. So anyhow, I conduct the investigation. It goes all the way back to the Department of Army. Hits Time Magazine that we have Wiccans and now we have recruiting. So. Uh, so anyhow, uh, the decision came from Washington, they could do nothing about it because of First Amendment. Okay, just like any, they were sanctioned and registered as a church in Sacramento called the Church of Set, Satanic Church, and it's probably the same thing today. The government could do nothing. The action that we took then was to uh, spread them out, reassign them because we couldn't do nothing with them to violate their First Amendment. But anyhow, that's, that's how things get misconstrued on the internet, and I get tied to Major Aquino, and uh, they have one picture of me in uniform that says Satan across it. I said, oh boy, that's really neat. <laughs> anyhow, that's the stuff that goes on. It doesn't bother me. So, does that answer your question, sir? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm clean. <laughs> yes. Good evening, General. Yes, ma'am. My question is about Christianity and Christian persecution. And I'm part of a, a prayer group for Pastor Saeed Abedini over in uh, I, Iran. And I just wondered if you have an update as to why our government cannot free him. They will do nothing. They're doing nothing about it. Absolutely zero. This is the Iranian. Uh, the purge of uh, the Christians in Syria, uh, the 80 churches, uh, of the Coptic Church, the Coptic Church is one of the oldest religions, Christian religions in the world. I was at the monastery of Pope Tadras, 300 years old. That's how far it goes back into Egypt. We do nothing. 
but yet we'll purge our military of Christianity, but we do nothing to help anybody that's in trouble overseas. Again, it's a travesty of justice. So we just have to keep pushing and pushing, but uh, Lurch won't take it on, so. They're trying to say that it's because of nuclear arms and things like that. I know. They're tying it to Canada. Yeah. That's what they do. They tie it to something else that we're negotiating, the arms agreement, and that's been a big success, by the way. Uh, it's, it's a government that's just ineffective across the board. The State Department's one of the worst organizations in the world. They're terrible, and they're arrogant. Uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's beyond explanation. I can't explain how we got there so quickly. Say again? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they really are. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have two questions. First of all, thank you for your service, sir. I'm proud to be in your company. Thank you. Uh, one of them is FEMA camps. It's all over the internet right. about FEMA camps, numerous uh, uh, concentration camp type facilities that are being built in the Utah desert and so forth. Right. What do you know about that? And then the second one is, is that all these upfitted Humvees that are coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq are being parceled right. out to the police departments. Yep. We're equipping them with the latest, uh, uh, short of, you know, 50 caliber gizmos up on top of the, the rigs right there to take over people and to confiscate weapons and the whole works. Is it deeper than just what's on the internet that you know about, sir? Well, I think a lot of it's conspiracy, but there are a lot of things going on. The purchase of ammunition by Homeland Security, uh, the MRAPs, they call it, E-M-R-A-P-S, the MRAPs, those are the vehicles that are being turned over to uh, uh, local uh, police. Uh, f for, uh, they say, uh, potential civil unrest in the country, okay? Obama's planning for civil unrest. And so they're plussing up. Uh, so the FEMA camps you're talking about, many of those are old National Guard camps that are already there. You remember we used them for the Haitians back in Pennsylvania and all of that. So those camps are around, and they would look to use any of those uh, garrisons and that for any civil unrest to arrest people and put them in. We know they're planning on it. There's no doubt about that. Their moves are out there. So uh, it's just another thing to be aware of. That's why it's important who you put in as sheriff. Make sure anybody uses your sheriff. Get them to, get them to say they stand by the people in the Constitution and hold them to it. Hold them to it. That's what we're doing up in Montana. So, and they're doing it in Wyoming uh, and other places too. The sheriffs are very important. Yes, sir. Crimea. Uh, I don't probably know much more than you do, uh, other than that Putin has a long-term plan to annex uh, many of those uh, adjacent countries back again into Russia. Not necessarily the total Soviet Federation that they have because it's too economically unviable. It's not viable for them. Uh, so uh, just like they did in Georgia, they took a couple of those provinces in northern Georgia. Uh, he'll, uh, he's consolidated now Crimea. I think he'll pause for, for now. I don't think he'll attempt to uh, uh, annex uh, the Ukraine uh, at this time. But he certainly has plans to expand that power base that they had before, but a much more controlled and much more governable type of, uh, of uh, future Russia. So I think that's what, the, what, that's what the situation is now. That's going to get worse, by the way. It's not going to get any better. But he wants those ports back in Crimea for the, for the uh, Black Sea Fleet. Yes, yes ma'am. Quick question. Um We've heard about the Muslim camps throughout the country, several in California. Have you heard anything about that? Different? Yeah, there's over 33 training camps. You know, they busted the one up in Oregon, and they have one in southern New York State. Uh, they're attracting many of the inmates that come out of prisons into those, training them in weapons and training them in, in Islam. And uh, that's what's happening in many of our prisons, you know. They're, they're converting a tremendous amount. Uh, into uh, Islamists, so that's, that's all going on. That's part of their program. That's how they get in. Again, the Trojan horses, the, the mosque, and uh, they have a plan and they're executing it. And the Muslim Brotherhood are the ones that are orchestrating that across the world. So, Excuse the, me. the Saudis are smart enough to say, no, no, no. Now the Egyptians are smart enough, no, no, no. So. Well, I think you've got to be aware of it and report it if it's happening. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. 
What do you suggest we start doing now? Well, I, I think what you're going to do tax day, uh, we have to go physical to a degree here, guys. We have to show up. We have to, sh we have to put our bodies up. There's going to be a big operation uh, by Colonel Harry Riley called American Spring, scheduled for May 16th. And Colonel Riley's running that. Uh, I don't know whether they're going to get the 10 million they want in Washington on May 16th. Uh, I don't know. You ought to interview uh, Colonel Riley, by the way, Paul, if you get a chance. Uh, we've got to make sure the elections this year. Uh, we've got good candidates, good Tea Party candidates. Uh, and if uh, if they're running against established Republicans, then boy, get behind them. We've got to get these established Republicans out. They are absolutely no good to, to, to the future of this country. So. Anyhow, you know all the things we got to do. I mean, we just got to get out there. We got to stand up. We got to we got to do the protests that we have to do, and we got to make it known. Because I'll tell you what, unless we can move those people out of Washington, it's going to continue to get worse for us. So, yes, sir. If and when things get worse, and there's the eye of things that are yet to come. Do you think that the military would back the citizenry? You understand the question? If, if it comes to any kind of martial law, for example, and they have to bring in the military, will the military support uh, the president, uh, the establishment, uh, or will they stand by the Constitution and the people? It's very mixed right now. I mean, the senior officers right now are, that aren't standing up would probably fall in to protect their own behinds uh, into, into supporting the administration and the commander-in-chief. On the other hand, I know so many things are going on with veterans organization, Marines. Uh, we have a whole network of Marines, special operations, special operations speaks. Uh, I know those people stand by the American people in the Constitution. So it's very mixed right now. You've got to understand, too, in the military, you have a lot of minorities in the military now that have been recruited in, not re yeah, recruited in, um, and uh, many of those may support Obama or, or whoever's the president at the time. So uh, hopefully they would have enough sense about it that they'll support the people. But there, are, there is, by the way, I got a call from a colonel uh, just retired in Nashville, Tennessee. He said when he left Fort Campbell, Kentucky, they had forms in there they were signing as to whether they would support the Constitution or support uh, the Commander-in-Chief. So that's, good. that's going on in the military. They're, they're testing them out. They're doing surveys. So this is bad. It's not good. Yes, ma'am. Uh, back to uh, Pastor Said. He's an American, and he had permission to go and, and establish these um, children's orphanages for children. Why can't the government, government take out the American citizen? Why can't they keep him safe? Wouldn't they take another American citizen if he wasn't Christian? They won't do anything. Not going to do anything. Just look at what they did in Benghazi. That's a good example. So Americans, when you travel, I got to tell you, you're traveling at a risk out there today. You got to really watch yourself. We're all targets. You got to be very careful where you go and uh, what cruise ships you go on and where you go in Mexico and you know. And if you travel safely, go with me. Anyhow, it was so funny, I had the State Department call me up last, about three weeks ago, and the FBI called me up. Uh, they said, do you know your life's been threatened? And the girl from the State Department, she says, are you in Syria? I said, no, I'm in Montana. She said, well, you better not go to Syria because they're going to kill you. I said, well, thank you. I've known about it for quite a few weeks, but anyhow, thank you for calling. But anyhow, if something would happen to me, I could tell you, they, they wouldn't, they wouldn't there would have to be some private contractors who would come get me. Uh, and that's bad. If I can't count on my government to come get me when I'm in trouble, whether I'm in the military or civilian, just like the, the pastor, I mean, it's sad that they won't take action. Yes, sir. You mentioned that uh, the, uh, the conflict between the Army and the, and the governments, well, I figure that is treason on their part, the government. Is there any side roads we can go in and bring this to our attention to the people and prosecute these people? You have the, the Attorney General is a, a flat out crook as far as I'm concerned. 
Uh, the, the guy that went to Chicago for mayor is the same thing. They got all these other people that like the people that were uh, weathermen type, blowing up cops and, and uh, robbing banks and their PhDs now in, in colleges. Is there any way we could officially just take these people and put them in jail or execute them or something? You know, I have to do sit <laughs> You have to do citizen's arrest. Um, again, it's the broken government. I mean, the court systems are broke. Where in the hell's the Supreme Court at on all this stuff? Where's John Roberts? Come on, what's going on? You look at, again, at Congress, you look at the Senate, you look at, uh, they, can, they can't get anything done. So what do we do? I mean, we're totally broken. They won't, they, they won't even issue warrants. Look at Lois Lerner. My God, she should be in jail. <laughs> Daryl Wise, I, you know, I liken it to a football uh, game. All these hearings get to the 20-yard line, but they never get in the end zone. No one's ever held accountable. Nobody goes to jail. But yet they're purging the military like hell. They're taking young kids in Iraq and Afghanistan. They're sitting at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas right now for killing people in war. So uh, that's the state of affairs we're in. We've, off, we've talked in Washington about forming an American Provisional Leadership Council of retired military and, and corporate guys and some other areas uh, to try to guide the government and fix it from the outside. And that's what we had to do on Benghazi, by the way. The Citizens Commission is a Citizens Commission. And we're the ones that are pushing the Benghazi. If it wasn't for us, that thing would probably have been dropped overboard like Fast and Furious and so on. So, yes. I didn't give you the right answer. It's just, we're broken. How are we going to fix it? And we all got to do it. Yeah. It's, uh, we need some, yeah, there you go. That's been talked about, too. I can't say that, though. I've been accused of a number of things, but somebody accused me of wanting to conduct a, a military coup, and I said, I never said that. <laughs> I may volunteer for it, but I never said that. Have you heard anything General? about nuclear weapons, that Obama had three armed nuclear weapons, and one was detonated by the military in the Atlantic Ocean? No, nah, that's probably some conspiracy thing. We have plenty of nuclear weapons, but Obama wouldn't know what to do anyhow. <laughs> no, they're all under tight control, though he's got the black box still, but uh, I, w I wouldn't worry too much about it. My question to you is, you say you can't trust the Democrats and you can't trust the Republicans. Well, should there be pamphlets for this party to say who we should back? Because we don't, 90% of You mean of at the national don't. level? Right. I don't know yet. Uh, the only thing I can say, I said it in South Carolina, I don't want guys like uh, Rubio because they're amateurs. They may be good guys, you know. Ted Cruz is going to need a lot of work. Uh, uh, any I, right now, I don't see good. any congressman or senator, and I, then I say to myself, what the hell are we looking for a congressman or senator to be president of the United States for anyhow? Absolutely. Let's find somebody else. Let's start looking for a great leader out there that's got common sense and wisdom. We don't have to get sucked in to accept these candidates that are put up by the Republican Party or somebody else. <clears throat> I'll give you, if I could put a president in tomorrow, it would be Admiral Ace Lyons. Four-star Admiral, he's 85 years old, his mind is just like that. Wonderful guy, track him. You can track him on a lot of the articles he writes, he's absolutely wonderful. <clears throat> but he's not going to run for office at his age, but we have people that can go into office and run this country. We may have to do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I've heard that, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, we know the aircraft went for six more hours and went down to 5,000 feet, too, and who knows? We'll see. Yes, ma'am. 
I, I love what Pastor Mike said at the pulpit. But I think one of the strengths that we really need is for all pastors to get up and say the way they really feel. They're, they're threatened by the IRS with losing their, uh, their tax sure. exemption. And some, I'm afraid they'll, that's where our, uh, most of our strength needs to come from. I Tea Party, great, but we need that back up from the churches or it's not. Oh, absolutely. And General Jerry Boykin gives a very good talk on that. You ought to get him out sometime because he's really focusing on that. But hey, listen, let's stop being PC. Give us our First Amendment. If I hurt your feelings too damn bad, you know, I mean. Man up to it, will you say man up to it? I mean, it's horrible, our culture is just becoming so, you can't say anything about anybody. But yet they can criticize Christians. Oh yeah, absolutely, criticize Christians all the time. I did another thing, all right? And this came from a black professor, a very good friend of mine, Ray Tanner from Georgetown. And uh, Ray looks exactly like uh, Morgan Freeman. Uh, and he was doing an interview after Obama was elected. And so the uh, talk show host uh, said, well, what do you think of our first black or black white president? And uh, he said black, actually. Uh, and so Ray said, I don't do black. The radio show, he didn't know what the hell to say. He said, I don't do black, I do people. Ever since that time, I've taken up that Every show I do, when they bring up black, I look at Fox, I'm trying to get Roger Ailes to change the dialogue. Get rid of Hispanic American, get rid of black American, African American. And all of you can do that. Because every time buddy, somebody says black or African American, say no, I do people. I do people. I don't care where they came from, what their culture or race is. But by God, they better be a good American if they're here. And be an American first before they're a Republican or a Democrat or anybody else. And that's what all your candidates better run on, being an American first. So, how are we doing? I got a question for you. Uh, you talked a lot about different problems, different situations. Who do you think is coordinating all of this? Are these things random? Or is somebody having an agenda and they are leading it down. Who are these people? Well, it's been going on. Actually, if you go on Amazon, there's a DVD called The Agenda. It's about 45 minutes. It is very good. It'll track the agenda all the way back to the mid-60s of what's been going on. And uh, the move to socialism, and uh, which is only communist light. So, uh, yes, there is an agenda. They're executing it very well in some ways, but they're so inept, as you can see with everything else, that's why they're getting in so much trouble with Obamacare and national security and everything else. So, no, there's an agenda, rest assured, and it's being funded very nicely by guys like Soros and others. I, well, I'm getting tired. I don't know whether I can go all night or not. I, <laughs> I wanted to tell you that the agenda is by the United Nations, because they believe in the New World Order, see, and so... Right. But I have a question for you. I like very much... Will you ask me what we should do with the United Nations? <laughs> Get us out. Get the United Nations out of this country and stop funding the United Nations. Would you tell everybody I didn't plant you there to ask that question? Because I, I was just waiting for somebody to come up and ask about the United Nations. Well, I get my information from the New American Magazine, okay. which I highly recommend. I'm very smart, and right. Washington knows it. Right. Um, I wanted to talk to you about... Did you want me to answer a question on the United Nations? <laughs> I have your answer. I'm waiting to give it. You'll love it. Okay, go ahead. I have something else to ask you. Yeah, too. part two, okay. Um, what do you think of Dr. Rand Paul? For I running, like him. For, uh, running, for running for the presidency? And no, I, I don't think he will, but I like him. The, the problem, here's, here's what with the libertarians right now. They've got to take on this national security thing, 
and that's where his father was just void of any national security and forces anywhere. And we can't do that because we've got threats against this. Uh, but Rand Paul, uh, very articulate, and uh, I don't think uh, he's quite there to be presidential material. That's why I say we need somebody else other than senators and congressmen, but uh, he's a good man. There's no doubt about it. He's smart. He's a doctor, and he uh, has cojones. So. <laughs> yes. Before you talk about the United Nations... Um, so I'm not going to talk about it. I'm just going to answer your question. <laughs> okay. Okay. What, if, what was the purpose then of the Red Chinese taking down that plane? Mothership? I don't know. <laughs> Well, if what's going on over there, according to the information I got, pretty, uh, pretty good that it went to seek cover and the passengers are still alive because uh, that plane was going for another six hours, so who knows. Okay, I'm going to answer your question on the United Nations. All right, here's the proposal. If I was president, I would actually move and recommend the United Nations move to Athens, Greece next month. Now... Lagos, Nigeria would be the second place. Uh, now, Athens was the beginning of the city-states, right? If you look back at your history. They're in deep financial trouble, okay? Greeks in very bad shape. Look what it would do for the economy to move the United Nations over there. The hotels, the restaurants, the taxi cabs, all of a sudden that whole economy would flourish. It would be out of the United Nations. Donald Trump, take this over, he'll convert it into condominiums. <laughs> Okay, and that we give them a paltry sum of money to help only in world assistance and health affairs. They do a pretty good job there. Everything else, forget it. They vote against us 80% of the time. They come over here and take advantage of our economy. I mean, can you believe the people that have been invited into the United Nations in America who hate America? You know? Anyhow. I would defund it except for things they can do in the World Health Organization and things like that. They're no good to the world. They're ineffective. Uh, they can't get anything done. Uh, all of these arrangements, even NATO today, is very ineffective from what it used to be. So, Okay, how are we doing? One more. Here. One more? And i got to go because I promised my sister I'd take her out to dinner or something. Do <laughs> you have any good places to eat here? <laughs> huh? <laughs> all right. All right. We'll get uh, Mr. Preston to make a good recommendation for us. I'd invite, I'd invite all of you to go have a martini, but I know you're all church-going people and you don't have any vices like I do. Yes, ma'am. Well, I have a question about what's going on in North Korea. Yes. Are we in... Another in wonderful country. Yeah. Are we going to be there to protect South Korea if something comes out of Kim Jong-il? Yes. Good. Yeah, I think, I don't know, we have 35,000 still there. Uh, we got the parts of the Pacific Fleet there, Air Force, uh, we got Okinawa, we got assets in Japan. So uh, Koreans are wonderful, South Koreans are wonderful people. How many have been to South Korea? Huh? Just look at your, Sam, just look at your Samsung TV and phone, I'll tell you how well they're doing. Uh, wonderful. Uh, and that's one of the great successes of America, by the way, is South Korea. Very tough, and uh, they're very good, very well trained, uh, and they'll kick the hell out of the North Koreans if they have to. So, yeah, a lot of more. Yeah, a lot of more. Yeah, absolutely, sure. So, anyhow, we're what country have we haven't covered Venezuela yet, have we? <laughs> anyhow, thank you very much. Thank you so much. You're right. awesome evening. What do you think, huh? Was it worth coming? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. All right. Michael, what do they call that in church? It starts with an R. <laughs> A revival. A revival, that's what we have here. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Well,